Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Kristen and Roman show. My name is Kristen Brown, and this is Roman Wyden. And we are so excited to start this endeavor with you all because Roman and I met probably in December about 2021 on a social audio app and immediately we had such great chemistry. We riff so well together. We are so in alignment with things that we think about and experiences that we've been through and the healing that we've had that at some point we decided, hey, we should do this. And it took about a year to get this together. But here we are now, we're super excited to do this. I am hailing from Phoenix, Arizona, and Roman, you are from? I am from Ojai, California. Awesome, awesome. So we're really excited to get this started. Quite literally, we made a list of topics based on another conversation. I just wrote down a whole bunch of topics and I said, Roman, we could talk about any of these things. And he was super excited to get started with this. But I will tell you straight up that Roman and I have do not have a script. We are doing this raw and real, just like the subtitle of this episode said, real talk, real life, real healing. We're talking about the tough subjects, the things that, uh, you know, we're hearing a lot more in the world today than we used to. But we're talking about the stuff that's really going to jumpstart people's healing. It's really going to go deep so that people can have the right information and knowledge to implement into their own self-healing journey. Yes, I love that. And thanks for thanks for creating this with me. And I'm so excited to be here. It's always been a pleasure talking to you, uh, being a fellow coach, author, just an inspiring human being and somebody who looks, you know, who goes deeper and who really looks into the fabric of our our patterns and and our traumas and and how we can heal and how we can integrate all the stuff we hear and read on social media or on television, or you know, we hear people talk about these inspiring quotes you know and we put them up on the wall and then they just live there and we go yay but actually integrating it in <laughs> life you know it's an art um it's a skill it's a it's a commitment to actually carry that onto the court of life not just sit on the bleachers and say yay go for it but actually going for it so i'm excited to have some real talks about real life and get some real healing going yes and this is this leads me to our topic that we're talking about today because we're talking about patterns. And the one thing that I've learned in my life is by recognizing my patterns, I it's a it's a great indicator to me about where I need healing because as human beings, we are going to think the same thoughts, we're going to think the same beliefs, which are going to drive the same behaviors. And many times those behaviors are unconscious. They're just they're autopilot that's coming out of us based on the way our brain formulated the best way to get our needs met. And I feel like this topic of being addicted to validation and approval is one of those things that we don't we don't necessarily set out to go, hey, I'm gonna go get myself addicted to validation because this feels good. It becomes kind of this, um, this natural thing that ekes into our life based on us wanting to feel a certain way because we're not feeling that way. Yeah. And um, we talked about this earlier. There's a there's an Andy Warhol quote, the famous quote that says, "In the future, everyone will get a 15 minutes a shot of fame." You wow. know, and it, it really, I always go back to that quote because I think we're now there. I mean, we have been for a few years since social media started. It's like the the stage of the world, the the screen, the exposure has expanded, and we now have, uh, you know. There's obviously celebritism and there's the media, but there's social media. There's everything is now about, can I got, get as many likes, you know, how many likes can I get? Can I get eyeballs over here, right? Because the advertising industry works that way. If they find someone on the internet that has, you know, 5 million followers, they know that if they take that person and they build a brand around it or a TV show or, or a guitar or whatever it is, right? that people will see it, the exposure, the eyeballs are coming to the brand, right? So now there's so many personal brands, right? Like you have your brand, I have my brand, all these YouTubers and these social media stars have their brands. And what do we want? We want exposure because we believe what we're selling, mm -hmm. I think at least in our case, is valuable to uh, uh, humanity. The yes. You know, the problem is, as you and I have talked about before many times, that we can get addicted to those those likes and those the, the validation, right? The approval by external sources. And that's what we're talking about here. That wires our brain a certain way. So we can't get out of that cycle. 
Yes. Oh my gosh. This is making me think about when Facebook first came around and all of a sudden you have people requesting to be your friend. <laughs> and that was so exciting. It's like, oh, these people want to be my friend. Like that felt good. There was a dopamine hit involved with that. And then I would post something and then people are liking this thing. Now I'm talking about the baby infancy of this whole thing. I'm like, oh, people like what I say. And it got exciting. And I liked that. And, but then I started to notice myself that I started to go to Facebook a lot because it was feeling good to me, but then it stopped feeling good at some point because I started to rely on that. And just the way the universe works, you know, it's like, oh, no, 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 don't rely on this. So when I started to rely on that somewhat, I'm not saying it was my whole life. I was, you know, relying on that, those type of accolades. But I started to to rely on that somewhat. And what happened is, is that I would post something and then I would get very few likes or very few comments. And I'm just talking my general personal Facebook page. This was before I was doing any of the work I'm doing now. And at some point I realized, I'm like, wow, I can tell that my mood goes up or my mood goes down. Yeah. Tendent on what's happening on flipping Facebook. Well, and you just said the key word, dependent on, yeah. right? That is huge because that dependency, that that you could say the flip side to independence, right? The, the opposite is dependence. And what we're now seeing uh, on, on these social media platforms is a dependency that without it, we don't feel whole. Like if I don't get as many like likes that I'm hoping for, right? What, what these YouTubers or TikTokers or whatever social media stars are doing is analyzing what worked. Oh, I showed a little more cleavage. I got more likes. Oh, I, I did it this time. I did it more crazy than last time. I got more likes, right? So it's almost like it's essentially like an AI feeding itself. It's like, you know, these YouTubers or these, these social media stars are then giving the viewer what the viewer wants, but not really what they want to put out there, right? Mm -hmm. In exchange for the likes, in exchange for the, the validation, in exchange for the approval. So essentially, we're feeding our own. It's just a weird loop that it we, is, it's you took the words right out of my mouth. It's a reward loop. Yeah. It's just a loop that just keeps going and going and going. And recently, I watched the Arnold Schwarzenegger show on Netflix or not show, what do they call them? A documentary. Yeah. Docu-series, and, yeah. Docu yeah. And I watched his and I also watched Sylvester Stallone's. And there's one thing, and don't quote me everyone, but there's one thing that they both said that I was like, yeah, because I know all about this as a coach that helps people reclaim their personal power. I help people heal their unworthiness, these type of things. I was sitting back watching this and I, I just have a filter through which I see things. And then they both said it. They both said in so many words, don't quote me, go watch it for yourself and you'll hear it. But something to the effect that they were addicted to that approval and to that attention that was coming to them. And I think it was Sly that said, and I wish I didn't have that because he said it took me because all of his focus went to that approval that it, he said it took me almost losing what was most important, meaning wife and family, to realize what was more important. And mm -hmm. I thought, you know, first of all, yay for both of them for being so transparent and saying, you know, I was addicted to that. You might say addicted to the fame, but really what it is, is that dopamine hit. It's really that approval hit. It's really filling that void inside. And if you look at both of those gentlemen, both of them had really awful fathers. I mean, it's fascinating to hear what these guys have been through. I mean, yes, they're these mega stars, but they've had their shit handed to them yeah. by their daddies, you know, like big time and over and over again. So, and that can drive us in some way to want to, to really excel, but unless we do the proper healing, we are going to get addicted to that reward loop. Yeah. One of my favorite authors, uh, you reminded me of, of a quote of his, or again, I'm paraphrasing. Uh, David Data, who writes a lot about uh, men, women, intimacy, feminine, masculine, and so forth. Um, and, you know, some people hate him. Uh, I don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You mm -hmm. know, anytime I read good stuff, I really look for the gems, right? And and he talks about this idea that if your father uh, was a firefighter, this is just an example, 
you'll either become a firefighter or an arsonist, right? You either go against what your father did or how who he was, or you do the same. And, you know, there's a, there's a sliding scale, of course. There's a, yes, yes. Right. But it's kind of what you were just saying. It's like, you know, you're either going to become an asshole like your dad, because that's what you know, or you're going to be like, fuck this. I'm never going to be like my dad. Right. Yeah. And neither is actually the true self, the true grounded me exploring myself, my uniqueness, my, you know, living my truth, you know, through my own path, on my own path. Right. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is what I wanted to say, um, you know, I personally, what you just mentioned about dopamine, I can so relate to it. Like the dopamine hits are everywhere. And I'm a big believer nowadays, and I get a lot of heat for saying that, that everyone has an addiction. Uh, we don't want to, we don't want to admit it. We don't want to own it because, and and rightly so, because addiction has a negative agreement in our society. Like we, we think yes. of of addicts, right. Of, of, of homeless with their needles in their arms. And, you know, um, we just don't see it in, for what it is. Like I always say addicts aren't addicts because they're addicts. There was a childhood trauma. There is a, a lack of nurture, a lack of love. There was abuse. There was just a disconnect from the primary caregivers such that we look for a coping mechanism. Like what, what, what helps me cope here? And I'm starting to believe as an ADHD coach and, and researcher and podcast host that ADHD is like a, a, an addiction. It's a coping mechanism. It's not a disorder. And I know there's more details to that, but you can see, hear that on my podcast. But really, when we're talking about these coping mechanisms, it's what can make me feel comfortable in this very uncomfortable moment? And who do I need to be in this moment so I don't have to be me right now so I can feel comfortable or loved? or just check out, right? That's that's what leads to all the addictions, whether it's food, gambling, alcohol, sex, uh, social media, even now video games, all these things are addictive behaviors. Doesn't make us bad people like addicts, but we, we do have, we do create addictive wirings in our brain that need the dopamine to feel alive, right? So let's just normalize this right now, right here and right now. Cause I, yeah. I talk about that a lot on my channel, Roman, is I'm like, first of all, we are the walking wounded, period. We've all been traumatized in some way, shape, or form. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Nobody That's got why. out. Nobody got out. No, no one got out unscathed. It's just not happening here on earth. <laughs> you can't trauma-proof uh, anybody. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so I think it's important that we just normalize this language for people so they stop feeling like there's something wrong with them. Because I believe, I believe this in my entire being, that the reason why we are seeking approval and validation outside of ourselves is because we have separated from our authentic self because we feel unworthy and we don't like who we are. So we're depending on the outside world to fill this void for us. And when we can get just really just own that inside yourself and say, you know what? I'm no different than any other person on this planet. I'm the walking wounded. I've had my traumas and I have separated from that self and believe because here's why a lot of times as we're coming up through life, I'm going to try to make this real short, but as we're coming up through life and we do have the traumas, number one, but we also just take in information from the outside world through our newly forming ego. What happens is, is we start to develop belief systems and programming inside of us about who we are. And we are fracturing away from that whole self. And because we believe the outside world took this away from us, because now this is unconscious programming in our head. So we think the outside world took it away from us. Now we think we need to get it back from the outside world. So then we start really getting addicted to these likes and we get addicted to, oh, I got attention when I was showing cleavage, like you said earlier. So what if I show some ass this time? Or what if my my shirt, my skirt is shorter? Or, oh my gosh, I went out tonight. I didn't get attention. So it, maybe it's because I'm not tan. How about if I go tan or you know, and this could be different for men, right? I'm just talking from the, the female perspective. And I'm not saying all women are like this. That's not what I'm saying. The generalized idea that we believe we have to get that validation, that approval, that acceptance about who we are because we've fractured from it. The problem is that this is a false analytic because Roman may accept this about me, but Bill does not. Roman might like this about me, but 
Jennifer does not. So we're, we're ping ponging through life, trying to get the, the feeling that we are whole, the feeling that we are worthy, but we're relying on a false analytic. Yeah. And we're actually never really checking in with the most important person that needs to validate ourselves, which is ourselves, right? Because, and validation, validating ourselves isn't just a function of, oh, oh yeah, I'm great. You're great. It's really about, and I've thought about this so many times and we can go into this. The key, the key theme that shows up is forgiveness to actually take everything that we think was wrong or a mistake or that we got shamed for or blamed for that we feel guilty about. If we can forgive ourselves and say, Hey, that's the past. I did the best I could. That's not who I want to continue being right? moving forward. When that forgiveness kicks in, it's almost like the self love kicks in the self validation. Cause you're saying I'm good, good. As in like, I'm not a bad person. Mm -hmm. I've made mistakes, but I'm okay. Like, I'm going to keep moving forward, right? To me, that's what that's where the self um, validation or self approval kind of starts. So the lack of forgiveness that we're giving ourselves is perpetuating the pattern. I believe it is the miracle cure. To be honest, yeah. I believe when we there was part of the miracle cure because I talk often about the five self love tenets, but one of those is that we we do need to forgive ourselves for the the mistakes, the missteps, the errors that we innocently everybody we innocently did we because of the way we are programmed because of the way we handled our traumas because of our the way our brain concocted our defense mechanisms all of these things were just driving our behavior in that moment some of my best ideas in a moment hurt me terribly yeah. or disrespected myself or dishonored myself but i thought it was a great idea in the moment right i'm like okay unconsciously Right. But if I would just have paused and said, is this really a good idea? That probably the logic would have kicked in and said, probably not a good idea. But because I was running on this autopilot of someone, please just make me feel like I'm loved. Please just make me feel like I'm worthy. Please just make me feel like I'm wanted. Because I was one, running on that autopilot, I didn't make the best decisions. And I'm not just talking about the times that we made poor decisions out of approval seeking. There's other things that we've done that, you know, we're not the greatest decisions in the world. But when I applied self-forgiveness, Roman, it was like this, If you know, you make movies, you understand these type of things, but it was like someone took this big filter and pulled it off my life. Yeah. It was like clarity because I was no longer trying to function through this super thick screen that was saying I was not enough. So when I really, truly worked on forgiving myself, and it wasn't that hard because of this concept. And other, this is, again, we talk about spectrum, you know, nothing is hundred percent absolute with every single person, but the spectrum is, is that I'm super, super logical and I'm super, super spiritual. So when something comes to me that makes sense, I will apply that to my life and I will see the most radical change. So when I understood that, first of all, I was innocent in what I did and that I did the very best I possibly could in that moment, how could I not let myself off the hook? Yeah, it's beautifully said. And I just want to point out to our uh, viewers here that uh, Kristen is an amazing author and wrote an amazing book, uh, The the Recovering People Pleaser. I read it. At first, I was like, yeah, I'll read it. You know, she's my friend. I'll read it, you know, and I just got sucked into it. So I highly recommend it. This is not an advertising for the book, but but it is. It's like a, a, a review you know, from someone who through reading the book discovered, oh, I am a fucking people pleaser. I kind of felt I was, I called it a chameleon. And like, you know, I grew up in Switzerland. It's a neutral country. We'll please everyone as long as, you know, we'll hold your money while you kill yourself in the war, you know, that kind of attitude. And so anyway, um, you guys see why I love Roman. Do you, do you get it? Okay. I'm just saying. <laughs> I love you too. And I love what you wrote and, and thank you for making a difference uh, for people because here's the thing. This is what I wanted to say. People pleasing is an addiction. People pleasing is a coping mechanism. Here's why, because when we please people, what we're really after is this validation that, oh, he's so nice. He's so good. And I love Gabor Mate in his new book, uh, The Myth of Normal. If you haven't heard of oh, Gabor just the Mate. title is amazing. 
Yeah, definitely Google that. He's an amazing, amazing guy. And I had the fortune to, uh, the, the honor to interview him on my podcast, ADHD is over. And one of the things he writes about is how a lot of, especially for some reason, the research I believe is leaning towards more women than men. And uh, he says that a lot of these women that have diseases or disorders, whether it's mental or physical, medical, um, are good people. They've been really good all their lives, but also quiet and suppressing their, their truth and, you know, AKA people pleasers. So he believes that, uh, and I do too, and I know you do too, that this sort of suppression of of the truth, not your truth, I believe there's just the truth. You speak the truth moment to moment and you kind of discover yourself and what your truth is. But that suppression of the truth, of people pleasing, because we're afraid not to be accepted, we're afraid to be rocking the boat, we're afraid to uh, be the bad guy, that actually causes the body to break down over time. It causes yes. mental disorders and physical disorders and disease. How, how could it not? It has to. I mean, we're yeah. it's all connected, right? Uh, yeah, because we are mind, body, and spirit. And this is about full health, mind, body, and spirit. You know, I want to go back just a little bit to talking about trauma because trauma and, like I said, the programming that we came up with through life, I'll give a small example of that. Let's say we're comparing ourselves to a magazine cover model. Or a man, men could be doing the same thing. Or this this guy in the high school gym has more muscles, or bigger body parts than I do, or whatever it might be. So, it, it, you know, when we start to heal this stuff, I this was so fascinating that I heard this. I love this because there's a book called The Body Keeps the Score, mm -hmm. and the guys, do you know about it? And the guy's name is Vessel Vessel Vander Kolk. I interviewed him as well. Yeah, he's fascinating. Oh my gosh, yeah. love his energy. So yeah. I was, you know, I've got YouTube on my on my big TV now. So I'm like, you know, it's like my Netflix now, YouTube. But I ran across him because I'd heard the book before, and I had a, um, interviewed someone on my pack podcast, the Sweet Empowerment Podcast, who had healed her body, and mm -hmm. she did it through the methods of that she had read through that book. But he said this; it was fascinating. He said, because we have um, fractured away from our authentic self and we feel powerless, okay, many times we feel powerless in life. He said that there is a state, can't remember which one, that if a child is a delinquent and they do something that breaks the law or whatever, they don't go to jail or to juvenile hall, whatever it might be. They get sentenced to theater. Get mm. this. You might have heard this. I'm so excited. I love this so much. They get sentenced to a theater group where they, because guess what happened? Something happened that led to this. Kids just don't pop out of the womb and all of a sudden go be juvenile delinquents, right? Right. Something led to this Some trauma led to this. And because they've lost their power, they said, what better way to retrain the brain than to put those kids in a theater where they are playing, mimicking a king or a warrior? Mm. So they're actually getting their own power back by doing that. Isn't that fascinating? I was like, I that is it. brilliant. And that should be mandated. And that to me is just one aspect of, of the sort of new modalities that I feel we need to introduce in the world for healing, right? Instead of our black and white judicial system of you go to jail. And by the way, this brings, this reminds me, I wanted to say earlier, this term narcissism gets thrown out a lot and I'll yep. connect it back to your story yep. because, you know, one of the things I hate and I don't hate a lot of things and I'm working on not hating it, but just accepting it, but <laughs> is the term gets thrown around so loosely and it's almost, I hear it almost now uh, a daily and about, you know, people that I'm like, I don't think that person's a narcissist, but here's the thing. The, the reason why I'm bringing this up is because if we can, just like addict has a negative connotation and negative agreement in society, so has narcissism, obviously. The, the, the issue here is that if we could look at a, a somebody we think is a narcissist and we can actually, instead of saying, oh, look, there's a narcissist or there's, there's a narcissistic behavior, if we could look at that person and say, oh, there is a deeply wounded child that at the time was made to feel like he or she wasn't going to get what they needed in the moment, right? Like attention, uh, real attention, like nurture, love, 
uh, because maybe they were the firstborn. And once the second baby came, the second baby was more important. So now the first one needs to like speak up louder. And, you know, maybe, maybe the first one doesn't get all the gifts anymore, right? So it's a learned behavior. It's not a, oh, this is a bad person. Oh, this is one of those narcissists, like a leper, you know, like we got to outcast. Them. Oh my gosh. It's just not what it is. It's the same with prisoners. Oh, they're like prisoners. They just got to go away, right? These are bad people or homeless or addicts. If we can integrate all those, those uh, you know, type of personas in our society through what you were saying, I want to lead back to that and have uh, theater for kids in, in these uh, situations or have a different kind of incarceration or consequences for inmates, for people who like broke the law or even... I'm going to push it now, even reevaluate the laws first so that the things we say that broke the law isn't really breaking the law. Maybe yeah. it's just a consequence that is love-based, not fear-based, not punishment-based, but actually truly a guidance system rather than a punishment system, right? I mean, I know we're talking like lofty ideas here, but you brought this up and I love it. I mean, just that idea of role playing and going back to creativity and, and inclusiveness, right? It's, it's massive. It's yes. And I hear exactly what you're saying. And I do want to just touch on the narcissism thing, but we should do it actually a whole episode on this because yeah, we, we, will. Could go, we could go on for days. And here's, what's interesting, you guys, Roman doesn't watch my channel. So he doesn't hear a lot of what I say. Our relationship is truly from the social audio app and from our personal friendship. Okay. So what he's saying is backing up exactly what I say on my channel. And this is not very much talked about right now, because let me tell you something, those narcissist channels on YouTube are huge, but I've brought it, I've introduced a new concept and we'll see how this, how this goes with people. But I've always, I stopped calling people narcissists, except if I'm doing a thumbnail or whatever, because that's the marketing and the advertising and what that's what people need to hear. But I started calling them NTPs, narcissistic type people just like you could be a ppp people please or ptp people please whatever people pleasing type person because all it means is there's a certain set of behaviors that this person is exhibiting that's been labeled in yeah, both ways I, I love it and 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 it's also just in this moment right it's not a predetermined for life kind of type of persona um so I, I, I love what you're saying because I, I'm a big believer that, you know, uh, say if we label people as narcissists or whatever, we, we can never attract anyone that's more healed than we are, right? So when we're with a narcissist, say in a romantic relationship or in a business relationship, it's a mirror. And when we point our finger, I love the saying, right? You point one finger, you have three pointing back at you, right? Because <laughs> I, I'm a big believer that if I'm with somebody and say, oh my God, what a narcissist, I'm looking into a mirror. And if I refuse to see that I have also narcissistic traits, because it's kind of like two magnets, right? If, if, or, or, or a space uh, craft docking at the International Space Station, right? If you dock together, that means there is a, a, a match, right? You can't, you can't dock a spaceship that doesn't mm -hmm. have the right docking gear to the space station. Mm -hmm. so, so I believe it's the same thing. So when we say, oh, what a narcissist, we got to be careful because we're essentially talking about our own uh, uh, traits that we currently have that we could heal. And when we do, we won't attract that type of person anymore that we that is not beneficial to our well-being or right. Yes, absolutely. So here's the thing. I, I'm just thinking, do I share this yet? Do I have a spoiler? But I just wrote down. Do it, do it, title. do it. <laughs> OK, I wrote down a title right before we got on here. And it says, this is going to be one of my next videos, why you should thank your narcissist. Oh, uh, see? <laughs> see, this is uh, how I think. So um, I love it. This is how, this is called a synchro destiny. This is like a, you know, there's no, there's no accident. Oh, I know there is no accident. I do want to say that um, the whole thing that people, I do want to say about narcissism before we move on is that narcissists and people pleasers are not born. This is not a, a, what do you call it? A physiological problem. This is not there's a no gene. There's no narcissistic there's no gene. gene. This is not a gene. This we are created and we are created the way our brain processed our environment. I also yep. say this to people a lot. I say people pleasing 
just because you're over giving to other people and narcissisms who are over narcissists who are over giving to themselves, which one is better and which one's more unhealthy? Neither. Absolutely. You know, we have this society that, that, that tries to put a good person, like a people pleaser ahead of a narcissist. Yes. Well, it's a spectrum. It's the other yeah. end of the spectrum, right? It's like, I want too much. I don't really need anything, you know, but somewhere in the middle is our true self that has needs, but also sets boundaries, right? You set boundaries with your own narcissistic behavior and you state the needs for the, the person that really needs something good or wants something, right? And as you know, from writing your book, which is brilliant, that it's it just all goes back to healing the trauma, rewiring the brain. And it starts with recognizing the patterns. That's the important part, right? If we are not self-reflective, if we, that's why I love the title that you just uh, wrote down. If you're not ever looking into the mirror and going like, oh, this is an opportunity for growth here. And this is a reflection of me. And I attracted this. And this is same frequency vibration that I don't want, but I need to heal first. What's my pattern? Absolutely. Absolutely. I attracted it. That was my whole gig. That That's what jump started my whole healing path was I am the common denominator, which yeah. my narcissistic type <laughs> ex-husband said to me, you're going to have two divorces. You're the common denominator. And I was like, I just kind of blew it off. But a year later, the very words that were meant to hurt me and crush me and make me feel bad, even though he was the uh, heavy drinker, he was the cheater, he was the physically abusive one, even though he was all of those things, I was still a common denominator in all yeah. these past relationships that weren't treating me well. So the words meant to harm me were the words that meant that actually were the words that started my healing path, which is just, I love it. Cool. And, and what you just wrote down when we do that episode, I will share more about my last uh, relationship that I had with this uh, wonderful human being, this wonderful woman that brought me to my knees and really showed me my own insecurities, my obsessions, my narcissism, my addiction, everything was handed to me in eight months, like never before. And it hurts and it still hurts. And I'm still healing and recovering. And I still think of her every single day, but I thank her every single day. Yeah. Like, um, it's going to get me emotional, but um, it's yeah. really, it's really a gift. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I mean, every day I thank this human being for, coming into my life and and allowing herself to be my mirror yeah because that took a lot of hurt on her, her uh, caused a lot of pain uh on her end as well yeah you know when we parted ways but it is so powerful to stop pointing the finger in life it is so powerful and it's so confronting and it's the work and i always say this and i get so passionate about it that's the only work for us to do. Everything else is called busyness, business, busyness, distracting from this work that you and I are talking about, that you and I are passionate about sharing. There is no other work. Any other work is an escape. It's a distraction. It's workaholism. It's whatever you want to call it. The work that we're doing may not bring financial gain right away, but when we clean that, retune that magnet, the manifestation magnet that we are, that's been clouded and dirtied up by what we just talked about, the need for validation and the traumas and the patterns and the insecurities and the shit, the judging and the righteousness. When we clean that up, what we manifest into our lives over time is way beyond any CEO salary you can make now being a workaholic, making 250,000 a year. It's a joke, right? And I'm in that process and I know you are, and, and that's what we're sharing, but uh, sorry for the rant, but I do believe that that is the work. First of all, no apologies ever here. Second of all, just to be clear, this was, I wrote this down to do a video on my channel, but we can <clears throat> do the same thing too. If we'll you do want. both. Yeah. As you oh, can I, see absolutely. how, you know, Roman got emotional about this. There is, there's so much humility in this when we really truly start to take radical, radical ownership for our lives. And what you're seeing in Roman is what, I did myself as well. I was like, this is me. This is me. 
And guess what, you guys, once we stop pointing out there and we start pointing within, we have just now started to take our power back. Yeah. We cannot control anybody outside of ourselves. We can only control self. So when we stop being the victim to life, when we stop looking at things through that lens and we start saying, I am going to take radical responsibility for my experiences, for who I allow, what do I allow? And mostly, like you said, the work, anything else is just distraction and it workaholism. Is. It absolutely is. I will also say that what I have found is that the work is not complicated. Like it's not super complicated. We just need to apply the right methods to our life. And that's when we're going to start to heal. And you will start to heal fast. Like you're going to start to see changes in you immediately. I was shocked at how quickly I just noticed myself being different. And I mean, in an upgraded, more healthy way. I just yeah. noticed myself not reacting, not doing the certain things that I used to do when I started to, to work on my, you know, healing myself. And that was the whole piece about, um, you know, forgiveness and all the, <clears throat> excuse me, all of those things that we did. But I want to go into the approval and what we can do to stop, you know, being in this addictive reward loop of trying to get approval, because I will tell you this, and I want this to be in like 10,000 font with neon is yeah. that it is insatiable. It yeah. will never be satisfied and you will constantly be whoring for approval. Okay. Well, that's what uh, Gabor Mate has another book called the Hung uh, in the realm of hungry ghosts, right? And that's what that is. It's a hungry ghost. You'll never be satisfied, right? That's right. That's and right. I, and I think that's a great question, right? Um, how do you uh, you said something earlier? How how do you break the cycle of approval or validation? How do you rewire your brain? And that's what I was saying. With you know the first step, I believe and jump in anytime is to recognize the pattern, right? So for example, for me, and I'll sh I share this very vulnerably and I, I'm an open book is I'm currently in a 12 step program for sex and love addiction. And this includes sex, love, uh, uh, fantasy, uh, uh, porn, masturbation, like there's different levels of, of addiction, right? And I, I, I do believe it's one of the most uh, epidemic um, addictions, 100%. you know? We're gonna talk and about that. We will, we will for sure. And one of the things that 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 I've been working on is to uh, it doesn't have to be writing down, but it's to have an awareness of when, for example, and I'll talk about masturbation for a second. It's like when did I feel the need to uh, senselessly, or not in a healthy way, not in a pleasuring myself and celebrating myself, but when did I just feel like I just needed to release the 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 pressure, the steam. And it was always when I got overwhelmed at work, when there was life's pressures weighing down on me. And it's literally almost a scientific, you know, uh, engineering kind of thing. When there's that much pressure, something needs to give, right? And an orgasm is that release of, of giving, right? And so seeing the pattern and realizing, oh, I just got stressed. Oh, I felt the need to do it, but I'm not going to do it. Oh, I just got, you know, stressed out or anxiety and a pressure. Oh, I want to do, no, I'm not going to do it. So kind of like you were saying, it's like when you start doing that work, the only way to do it is moment by moment to, to create yourself anew and to go, I'm not going to let the brain fire the same way it has in the past. Cause that's the addiction. That's the wiring. I'm going to rewire it one action at a time. That's where the actual results come from. They do come from that. And that's substantiated by Dr. Joe Dispenza, who does the most amazing work in the world, in my opinion, right now. And he talks about, you know, anytime that we are fire and wire our neurons constantly repeating this, it just becomes our auto autopilot. Boom, boom, boom. But when yep. we start to place our attention in a different way and we slowly start to move over here, what happens is, is that this neuron, and I might be saying all this wrong, I'm using his words, will steal the glue. That's what he said from this one, because this one's getting more action. It's going to steal the glue from this one. And this one will eventually dissipate. So that's literally Absolutely. what the rewiring is because eventually this is just, just where we go. This is the autopilot. And I also I want to, just, yeah, go ahead. I also want to talk about um, how I healed my addiction to approval. 
And I didn't know I was in addiction. I didn't know I was addicted. I had no clue because it wasn't hurting my life. It wasn't hurting anybody else around me. It was yeah. hurting me, but it was hurting me in a way that I didn't know it was hurting me because I had been that way for so long. It wasn't until I did look at the pattern and take radical responsibility. Like you said, step one, when I started to do that, I was like, oh, okay, this is starting to make sense. But not only do we forgive ourselves, okay? When I believe when we give ourselves radical acceptance and compassion for all of who we are and for all of what we've been through, that's another thing that Bessel van der Kolk, I think, is how do you say it? Yep. Um, but that Bessel said, he kept saying over and over again, this, this man is a psychiatrist and a neuroscientist, I think, or neurologist or something like that. And he even said the same thing. He kept saying in this talk, compassion, self-compassion, self-compassion. So people are hearing these words and they're like, they're, they're saturated all over the internet, compassion, love yourself. Eh. And people are thinking, oh, I don't want to hear that again. People, this is what self-love is. Self-love is self-forgiveness. Self-love is self-compassion. I believe self-love is the miracle cure. So when you start to give yourself self-compassion, you truly accept all of who you are, no matter what it is about your body and understand that you are holy and divinely made just how you are, you you're you're going to start returning back to your authentic self and here's the thing through that compassion and acceptance this is a biggie right here what i'm going to share with you through that compassion and acceptance what you're going to notice is you're going to stop judging yourself you're going to stop thinking there's something wrong with you and you know for the most part because this is a journey so i'll get through a big chunk of beliefs about myself and then as life goes on, I'm like, all of a sudden I notice more beliefs about myself or I start on another journey and more beliefs, old beliefs come to the surface and then I will work on those. So this is all practice. But what you will notice is that when I started to do this work for myself, I noticed that I didn't fear judgment near as much as I did in the past where I was so uh, hustling for approval and bustling around, trying not to rock the boat and do all these things and wear the certain outfit and have the that, 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 all the things. I stopped doing that and I and I started giving zero fucks because I didn't care anymore what people thought. I was like, okay, I mean, some you know, people judge people about what they'll wear to the grocery store. Sometimes, guess what? I was a hairdresser for 30 years. I dressed up every day, had the shoes, the hair, the this, that. Sometimes I will go to the grocery store now looking like <clears throat> that person that my fellow hairdressers used to judge. Okay, oh, don't wear Crocs. You're not going to be classy. Fuck that. If I feel like I'm wearing my Crocs and socks, that's what I'm going to wear because yeah. I don't judge myself anymore because I'm not my exterior. I am my interior. So by me going within and truly applying this work, and I tell you, the work is not hard, but you have to be consistent with it. You have to be willing to take the time every day to do it, to catch the disempowered thoughts, to feed yourself the self-forgiveness and the compassion and the acceptance and all of the things. You will notice that you will stop caring. And I'm just going to say with this disclaimer in parentheses, as much as you did before about what people think, because yeah. am I in a place, Roman, where I absolutely don't care about what people think? 100%. Nope. But am I pretty good there now? Remember, I've been on this journey for 12 years. Yes. Do I still have my fears? Yes. Do I still think sometimes I suck and I'm not good at things? Yes. All that stuff still comes up for me, but it doesn't last near as long, nor does it floor me or keep me stuck like it used to. Yeah. I love that. And I just want to go uh, back to something you said, which was about... um you know, self-love, like I've come to uh, realize that th that's the only work is to return ourselves to ourselves, right? That's the work I do with my coaching clients, whether it's relationships, yes. or even ADHD. Uh, coaching isn't about ADHD anymore for me. It's not about tips and tricks. That's other coaches. You can go there and learn some, some pony tricks. That's fine. It's really about returning in my case for ADHD parents the parents individually back to themselves like to re-love themselves right because we're born loving open canvases beings right so one thing um that I noticed with my clients and that's where I sort of root my coaching in nowadays is the only way that as human beings, we can start to actually love ourselves and respect and, you know, all of the stuff that we mentioned 
and it's I I'm I'm trying to word it carefully because it's so nuanced, but we will not be able to truly respect and love ourselves if we are still keeping secrets and resentments with the people in our lives. And there's more to that. But I believe that when we tell the truth, like radical truth, and sensibly, right, we're not just vomiting into people's lives and, oh, I'm telling the truth and this is what I feel. Right. But really learning to share authentically, vulnerably, everything, our secrets. Here's why that's important. Because guess who knows all about all the secrets that we keep and hide? We do. Mm -hmm. I know when I keep secrets. And when I keep secrets, I can't possibly be loving and confident in who I am. Because I know that I'm really hiding something from the world. And there's a shame I, filter. There's, there's a, shame a shame filter. Yeah. And that to me, when we start telling the truth, and that's why I'm such an open book, right? I'm in a 12 step program for sex and love addiction. I have no problem talking about it because that's what I'm dealing with. That's who I am right now. And I'm transforming that, right? That's not who I be for life. And so that, like, I call it, um, I love. Uh, purchasing URLs, right? I, there's something about buying website names. And I, I recently had an idea and I couldn't believe it was available. It's called truth yourself. Oh. So it's tr truthyourself.com because we get to truth, us, we get to, you know, pour a bucket of truth over ourselves moment, moment and say, I'm going to just, I'm going to tell the truth now. I'm, this, this is the fucking truth. And then what happens is we become confident that, oh, I'm a truthful person. I'm not lying anymore. I'm not hiding anymore. I'm not cheating anymore. I'm not keeping secrets anymore. I'm a truthful, guess what happens? You stand up more straight. You can look people yes. in the eyes because you don't have to hide from them. You don't have to go, hopefully they don't find out that I'm kind of lying or I'm kind of cheating. I'm kind of hiding. And that to me is what you were talking about. Now you look that person in the mirror. I love you because you're not, you, you know that, I can love you because you're honest. And yes, you've created some shit in the past and made mistakes, but I love you because you're now an honest human being. So I just want to say those two to me, hand in hand, no truth, no self-love. It's just, or secrets equals, you know, lack of self-love. It's um, if you have all that in, if a person has all that inside of themselves, then they're, they, and they're trying to apply the healing work without the truth. They're putting frosting on dog shit. Yes, we, we, we have to clean out. We have to clean it out. I often use this uh, analogy. It's like we're cleaning out our garage. If you walk in this garage and there's this, this, it's just a hot mess. It's just so much crap in there. The first thing we do is we take everything out of the garage. Okay. Put it all out on the driveway. Take everything out of the garage. That's truth. That's ownership. That's responsibility. That's recognizing patterns. All of it comes out of the garage. Then we say, What's, what am I going to keep? What am I going to throw out? What goes to goodwill? What am I going to donate? Whatever it might be. And then when we start putting stuff back in, the garage is nice and neat. So we're actually keeping our vessel clearer and cleaner, which to me, it's fascinating because if I'm, if I've dealt with somebody who had a lot of healing to do in my personal life, and we were talking about Okay, you guys, as you could tell, that was a really abrupt ending. We do not know what happened. We're just sitting here. I think it was a ghost. I'm just going to say it's paranormal because I blame everything on paranormal. My lights have been flickering today a lot too. So maybe well, something with me. I will say, uh, I'm glad you brought that up because I will say that whenever uh, in my life, when I am challenge the ego and I really go towards love versus fear, there's almost a clingy kind of interruption of like, well, wait, don't, nah, 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 nah. we want to keep you here in the ego. Like, you know, so, hey, maybe it was the ego ghost who was like, I don't want to talk about the garage cleaning out. I want to, let's move on. <laughs> That's so <laughs> funny. That was, that was a brilliant example. I love that. Like taking it all out and then really before putting it back in, like what's important and what's not, you know? And who am I, right? 
So what I was going to say though, is that when I was dealing with people in my life as, you know, been, having been on my healing journey for quite some time now, am I perfect? No. Am I 100% healed? No. Am I fully enlightened? No. I would never claim all of those things, but I'm aware. I'm very aware. And I will say I have healed the, ma the majority of my wounds. I mean, if they come up, they're so tiny anymore that they just don't wreak havoc in my life. But what I was going to say is, is talking about how it, it makes life so much more clearer when you don't have all this junk, when you don't have all this baggage, when you don't have this yeah. huge filter. And what I notice is that people who still do, they're going to often try to make you wrong. And they're, they're not going to want to take responsibility for their stuff. So they're going to try to make you wrong. However, when you've cleared up your stuff and you have returned back to your whole self and you know you, and there's no other way to explain this until you actually experience this. But when you return back to that, you're no longer easily manipulated. You don't fall for the BS that others are throwing on you, the unpeeled, unhealed people around you. In fact, you will show up to them an even more cleaner version than you did prior. So our healing actually contributes to the collective healing because we're not showing up as wounded and this person's showing up as wounded and all these people and all these egos are fighting. Yeah. Now, we, like I always say, if, if, you, if someone's unhealed wounds is a scribble on a page, and then you take the same pen and you add your unhealed wounds to it. It's another scribble on the page. You can't tell who is who. Yeah. But if you clean up your side, you are a straight line on the page. And then you it becomes blatantly clear. Yeah. And you're in the market. You're in the business of taking responsibility. So even if something of yours does come up, you're like, my bad. That's me. You know, I love that because last night I, I couldn't sleep. And I woke up, I literally woke up and I thought, I guess it's, I bet it's 1.30 and it was 1.33. And I, I, I got on YouTube and I said to myself, I'm just going to listen to some kind of a spiritual talk or something and it'll rock me back to sleep, right? Not ideal, but once in a while it happens. So I was listening to this woman who I've uh, listened before, I forgot her name, um, but she is this, this just powerful channel who just says stuff where you're like, where, where is she pulling this from? Like, it's just, it's so seamless. She just flows with it. Right. Yeah. And it was kind of what you were just saying about the, the scribbles and, and, and this idea that what's happening in our world right now, any war, any, any conflict that's going on is a external um collective expression of our internal struggles and our internal conflicts yeah. and the only power we have and this goes back to what you were saying earlier if you take radical honest like ownership right of of everything in your life then the only thing to do is to literally go inside and do that work like 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 i say put your own house in order first yes. world world peace isn't the res isn't going to be the result of some some action by a government or some new rule or law or some uh, meditation or some kumbaya and, and i say this with love like i love meditation yes. i think prayer all of that affects it yes but the individuals like you and i or or the person viewing this doing the cleanup in here first is what's going to change and affect the collective external reflection of that, right? Well, be the change you wish to see in the world. My favorite quote. Yep. And as within, so without, right? Yep. So as you work in within, it starts to, to, I call it bleeding, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but it bleeds out onto the people around you. But the same unhealing will bleed out onto the people around you. Yep. And it's fascinating to watch my children because I have healed myself so much and continue to that I look at myself as a parent in my middle twenties or early thirties when they were, you know, four or five and, you know, those type of things. And I was, yeah, all the love was there. All the desire to be a great parent was there. everything was there, but the way I parent now is so much different and so much more cleaner and so much more wholesome and so much more I don't even know how to how to describe it. And this isn't a parenting podcast, but it's just I've watched how I just who I've become in life has changed so much in such a positive way 
because the ultimate goal, I will tell people on my healing journey, the ultimate goal was, I just want peace. That's what I just kept saying. I just want peace. I just want peace. I, well, how do we get peace? By not controlling our external environment, by controlling our internal environment. And I had made a note here to mention in this that when we are constantly seeking approval, validation, acceptance, love, attention, when we are in that repeated loop, we are in, we, there will never be any lasting peace. It's going to be from one hit to the next hit, to the next hit, to the next hit. And we will always be insatiable. We will always be wanting more. Yeah. And, and that makes me think of this, this, uh, thought I had the other day where, um, we're not good at setting boundaries with people, right? It's just, we're not taught. It's just not part of our parenting, uh, 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 learning hand me down, right. That we're learning from our parents that they've learned from their parents. It's not, it's still not part of, uh, our fabric in society, our educational system. It, it's just not, you have to go to conscious parenting or aware parenting courses to learn it. Right. And setting boundaries is just us honoring ourselves and saying, for example, I am not comfortable in this situation. I'm going to remove myself or please do not talk to me this way. I don't, that doesn't resonate with me, right? Setting boundaries will rock the boat. We'll get somebody upset. We'll, you know, and so setting boundaries cannot coexist with seeking approval. It can only be either, like either or, like you can only absolutely seek approval and then you get it and you're like, okay, everybody's good. No, bo no boat was rocked. I'm liked. Okay, good. Right. Or you set a boundary and somebody may not like it, you know, and um, you're not getting approval. But by setting boundaries, what you're getting is self-respect and self-love, which is way a better dopamine hit over time than approval. You yes. Know? And what comes for self-love or boundaries? This is a question. It's actually a subtitle in my book because I was talking to somebody on a social media app who kept saying, oh, just set boundaries, just set boundaries, just set boundaries. And I said to him, do you know it's impossible for some people to set boundaries? He goes, no, 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 no. The more good, the, the better you get at it or the more you do it, the better you get at it, kind of like tying a shoe. And although there's a lot of truth in that, there's a lot yeah. of truth in that, but for me, I believe it again, there's that there's that spectrum, there's that continuum, that sliding scale of where am I at on this journey? <clears throat> because I was able to set boundaries, but I wasn't able to hold them because I didn't want to look like a bitch. I didn't want to look mean or controlling or all these things that people were calling me when I started to get the backlash, right? Yeah. And yeah. I could not maintain the boundary to where like, this is a hell no, absolutely not type situation. Like they do not get to do this again. And then I will apply an action boundary if they do, which typically means removing myself yeah. from proximity or what have you. But I, I wasn't able to do that portion of it until I started to really truly apply the self work, self love work, that healing work, that self approval, because that rooted me so much in my worth that it became a hell no. Right. Yeah. It wasn't just, hey, yeah. I'm making this request, but you're not going to do it. So I'm going to go, OK, you know, yeah. so so there's I just want to as we close this down, as we shut down this talk, I just want to encourage everybody to know that this is a journey. This is not one and done and this is not perfect and it's not wasn't perfect for me. It wasn't perfect for Roman. This is or anybody else that I talked to. This is about just setting your eye on the prize that you want peace, that you want healing, that you want empowerment, whatever it is that you want, and just start making your baby steps towards that direction. And I promise you the universe is going to hear your call and it's going to start meeting you and it's going to start guiding you to the right people, places, and things and information and books and quotes and just things that are going to pop in because you have now opened your energy to receive. Yeah. So give yourself grace on that with grace is another self-love tenant give yourself grace on this journey okay rome wasn't built in a day sometimes we don't return back to our whole selves in a day yeah and uh i agree that and i think one of the key words you used earlier is awareness right i think uh it starts with awareness uh i'll close with a really quick example i was at an event recently uh with the with my boy's mom i'm going through a divorce separated and we have overlapping friend circles and we went to an event that I felt it was okay to go together because it's very amicable we're we're really working through it uh, consciously 
but I was at the event and at some point I felt, I literally remember thinking, I'm, I don't feel comfortable. And then because of my awareness, my recent awareness, this is very recent for me. This is like, you know, maybe eight months of intense therapy around setting boundaries and stating needs. I realized, oh, I'm not comfortable equals I'm uncomfortable, right? And so I eventually had to share that with her and say, you know what? I felt uncomfortable there. And for her, that was a trigger. That was like anger came up. It was like, F you. What do you mean you felt uncomfortable with me there? And I totally get her reaction. I get the, the anger justified on her end. But I realized that was me setting a boundary. Moving forward, I want to discuss each event we go to. And if I don't, if I think I might feel uncomfortable, then maybe you go and I don't go, right? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But her reaction was so intense that it would have been easy for me to go like, ooh, in the future, yeah. don't do that. Don't set that boundary because yes. she's angry, right? So I just want to put that out there to people that at the beginning, it's going to be like, like being in a minefield. You set a boundary and somebody explodes and you set a boundary, somebody explodes. It, they're never going to stop exploding. Other people will do what they do, but it's going to get easier for us to set the boundary, let them have their emotions, not take it personal and and just remind ourselves that that was, that was from self-love and self-care, right? Yes. Yeah. Amen. So I want to invite everybody who's listened to this episode to please comment below and let us know what you thought about it. I would also encourage you to write any question you have about this topic or really any other topic that relates to healing or relationships or ADHD. Roman's you know, awesome at that. And all re recovering people, pleasers, boundaries, whatever it might be. We have a a wide array of topics that we are going to be covering on here. So don't think that your question is outlandish or out of bounds or whatever, because we're pretty much ready and able to approach, tackle any question that comes along and we will work through it together. So I just want to say, if you've enjoyed this, please give us a like on both channels, because this will be aired both on my channel at Kristen Brown and Roman's channel on YouTube, which is at ADHD is over at ADHD is over. So thank you guys for being here so much. This was so much fun, Roman. I'm so, so, so grateful that we finally had yes. the time and the space in our lives and in our healing and our schedules and our families that we could actually make this come together. And I'm yeah. looking forward to more episodes. And me too. And thank you for really spearheading this. And I'm so inspired. This is what I love doing. And thank you for those of you who watch this content. There will be many more exciting episodes. And until then. Thank you, everybody. Bye.